Hello, welcome everyone, both those in the room here at NYU and those who are watching us via live stream. Uh, I'm Catherine Wilhelm, Executive Director of the US Asia Law Institute at NYU School of Law. And uh, today is a special program because our featured speaker is our director, uh, Jose Alvarez, uh, who is going to be talking about his new book, uh, which is uh, groundbreaking and in parts, I think, controversial. Uh, titled Women's Property Rights Under CEDAW. And CEDAW, of course, stands for the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And here to discuss it with him is none other than a member of the expert committee that uh, plays the role of interpreting and monitoring uh, the, the implementation of CEDAW, uh, Rangita de Silva de Alwis. And I'm going to briefly introduce both of them and then refer you to our website for their full stories. Uh, so Jose is the Herbert and Rose Rubin Professor of International Law at NYU School of Law. He's a former president of the American Society of International Law. And I want to uh, add that um, ASOL, the American Society of International Law, this year has selected him to receive its highest honor, which is the Manly O. Hudson Medal, and he's going to receive that in just a couple of weeks. So that's a really big deal. And uh, so congratulations, Jose, both on the book and on the, uh, on the Hudson Medal. Um, then, as I said, Regita is a member of the treaty body of CEDAW. And she's also uh, based at the University of Pennsylvania Carey Law School, where she is the Associate Dean of International Affairs and also teaches courses on international women's rights and uh, directs the Global Institute for Human Rights. And somehow she also finds time to teach at Harvard and Oxford and other leading law schools, um, spending a lot of time on planes. And uh, on a personal note, when I first met Rangita, she was, it was in Beijing, and she was engaged in a very long running kind of conversation and collaboration with leading Chinese uh, feminist scholars and lawyers who work on uh, uh, women's rights issues in China. So she's very grounded in the reality of how pseudo plays out uh, in various countries uh, at different levels of, uh, of development and so on. So anyone who is interested in buying a copy of the book, Women's Property Rights and Lucido, uh, can find a discount code on our website. Yeah, the, <laughs> that's the version now. That's that's. But without the uh, uh, the, the beautiful cover, the cover art. Um, so there's a discount code on the website, and also you can download Chapter Seven for free on our website. And I think Chapter Seven will guide you directly to probably the most controversial part, actually, of of the argument that he's making. So our format today is going to be that uh, Jose is going to introduce some of the key messages and findings of his book. Uh, I should point out that he's co-author, he has a co-author, Judith Bowder, the uh, co-author is not able to be with us today. She's based in Vienna. Um, so, so I should have mentioned that earlier. But Jose will, uh, will introduce some of the key messages. And then uh, Rangit is going to share a few of her reflections from the from her own point of view personally, not speaking for the committee. Uh, and then they're going to have a conversation. And we'll, then finally, we'll be taking questions from the room and from the live stream. Those of you on live stream, I think by now everybody knows how to answer the questions in the, in the usual question queue. So there we go. And Jose, over to you. So first off, since it's the first time I'm presenting the book here at NYU, I wanted to thank Amy, uh, as well as uh, of my assistant Stephanie Ramos and of course Catherine uh, Wilhelm um, and let me just say for those of you who are here at NYU uh, this is a, a trio that runs a center with minimal resources and yet accomplishes more than most centers how they do it is a constant mystery to me um, or, and to their families I assume uh, but in any case I want to thank them for making this possible I also want to thank Beth Kelly, uh, who is here among many of the folks who uh, contributed to this book. Beth was instrumental as one of my research assistants. She's also celebrating herself on a Jessup uh, accomplishment, which I hope will continue further into the annual meeting uh, next month. Uh, and and uh, uh, other than Beth, 
There have been many other NYU students, perhaps some of them online, that I should thank over the years. Uh, so this book is about what you see on the screen, which is not a surprise to most people, uh, which is the gender of wealth and property around the world, heavily skewed into the male side of the ledger. You can measure this not just by graphic uh, little uh, jars, but by who is in poverty, the feminization of poverty. You can measure this by the proportion of males versus females as to who owns businesses or who owns a farm as opposed to producing the agricultural product or who has low paying jobs, who works in the informal sector, uh, who uh, does not even get paid for their jobs because they're working in the home. So this is well known, and so the first chapter in the book puts it in that context, but it also puts it in the context of the many different ways that we in the world and countries in particular, and even some market actors are trying or have been trying or claiming to be trying to do something about this gender gap, which is, as the book describes, more of a chasm than just a gap. Uh, so the book is structured around an introduction, then 130 plus pages of a description uh, of what the CEDAW committee, an expert body that you just heard about and that Ranjita is a member of, uh, has produced over the years in terms of its output dealing with this. And that chapter was written by Judith Bowder. Uh, and then uh, six other chapters that try to analyze this from various perspectives, uh, critiques of, of CEDAW from feminists, for example, critiques of international property rights, and human rights from a variety of scholars and others, both inside international law and not, and then two comparison chapters comparing this CEDAW regime to the international investment regime, which at least at the global level, most people think of when they think about protecting property rights. Chapter six compares this jurisprudence from CEDAW uh, to the two leading covenants, one on civil and political rights and the covenant of economic, social, and cultural rights. And then uh, the last chapter, which as, uh, as you've just heard, is available on the website. So this is the celebratory cover. Uh, this is, the artist is Mutu. Uh, she has a extraordinary uh, collection and body of work, which you can now see right now, uh, which I just saw in New Orleans, uh, over a hundred works on print, paper, sculpture, and so forth. She's an Afro-futurist, which does connect to some of the critiques of CEDAW that are addressed in uh, chapter four, for instance, as well as chapter five. And what I'd like to say at, at, at this point is that it reflects not just the realities, the gender realities that, uh, that we see, and also the optimistic hope, because I think the bottom line of the book is that there is at least a promise of transformational change in this jurisprudence, but many, many challenges uh, for some reasons uh, to do with what happens in Geneva, but many of them have nothing to do with what happens in Geneva and happens every day in every country on earth. What I uh, like to say at the outset is that the book is basically one way of thinking about it in a short term way is two quotes from Catherine McKinnon that are cited. In the very first paragraph, I cite her quote, uh, which I think is, is blunt but accurate, that globally speaking, women are more likely to be treated as property than to have any. And a second quote much later on, that frequently, again, at the global and domestic level, women have to leave home, and here I would add, and their countries to try to achieve justice in them. And of course, that's one of the framings for thinking about the role of an international treaty. CEDAW, the, uh, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, is the leading and perhaps only a global treaty uh, ratified now by 189 countries devoted to the equality for women. It's been in effect since 1981. 
Those 189 countries do not include the United States. Uh, and the, uh, that CEDAW treaty is complemented by an optional protocol entered into by 115 of those states, which permits individual and, and group complaints or communications to the CEDAW uh, committee that sits in Geneva. At the outset, uh, as the book tries to introduce, there are many different ways to get at this. One way is the educational and many other roles of UN women, which point out, as you see in this graph, that if you start with women's empowerment and actually focus and give value to that, you achieve everything else in that uh, symbolic circle. That is a virtuous circle that says if you empower women and treat them equally, you will improve not only their educational levels, but the educational level of the entire country, nutrition levels all the way around that circle. Another effort which recognizes that effect in the same way, does not contradict it, but is very consistent with it, that's worth discussing. And in fact, I'm so pleased that Ranjita, the world's expert on SDG5, uh, and so if, you, if you've been living under a rock for some time, uh, the, the UN is driven by this global uh, development agenda, which seeks to achieve some 17 extraordinary goals from ending hunger and poverty uh, to SDG 5, the Sustainable Development Goal 5 on achieving gender equality. And I think, as Ranjita points out in a luminous chapter in the SDG commentary, uh, that emerged, uh, the, the, what is really striking about this effort is the attempt to do specific indicators to make sure that states can't claim, we don't know what we're supposed to do, uh, but here are the specific things. And even this little table shows you, don't do the following things. Look at the X, and that is eliminate all harmful practices such as child marriage, eliminate violence, and discrimination, and do recognize uh, the value of, uncare, of uh, unpaid care work, ensure women's participation in decision making, universal access to sexual and reproductive health. Uh, and those are, that's a whole different effort, which I consider not just policy, but rather regulatory, actually. Uh, but that's a different uh, effort. It is not specifically or expressly a human rights framework, although I would love to explore in our fireside chat, and that's why this, ta uh, this, this talk is going to be brief, because I'm very anxious, even though we don't have a fireside and we don't have the little comfortable chairs, uh, to really engage with what is the world's expert, not just on CEDAW, but on the SDGs. A third effort that I think is worth saying something about is the World Bank, which discovered that maybe focusing on equity is not enough, and actually changed its view to uh, equality. And one of the leading things, not the only thing, but certainly one of the things that the World Bank focuses on is getting these little slips, yellow slips of paper, land titles, into the hands of women. And that is quite important. But what CEDAW, I think, the committee has realized uh, is having a land title is no good if the courts don't respect it, if culture, religion doesn't uh, do anything for you. So that, that approach which is on land titles, is only one part of it. The other thing that I think is valuable from, from these efforts is measurement of improvement. And let's just say that the gender snapshot on SDGs is extremely depressing on that point, because especially since COVID and, and conflicts and economic and climate change issues, the position of women has regressed on many of these and in fact, we're farther back uh, on the SDG achievements. Nobody really thinks that we will achieve SDG 5 or perhaps any of the others by 2030. But measuring is how things get done. So I do applaud however flawed uh, these alternative methods are. So what is this one? Well, CEDAW is renowned, uh, but just as a for those who are not familiar with it, its text is well worth reading, drafted in 1979, so it does have uh, some issues. Uh, that is, uh, it, it basically says this is a binary, which we now don't think is a good thing, 
the men versus women. But subject to that, it is, goes beyond formal equality. It is not content, in other words, to look at a state's law and say, you're gender neutral, therefore you've achieved it. What it cares about is whether the law, the customs, and everything else result in substantive equality. That is, do women actually get the same thing, or are there special things you have to do precisely because of the structural and other uh, things that women face that are impediments to substantive equality? And so it goes to substantive equality, and it also cares about uh, not just the de jure position of women, but de facto, what actually happens to them on the ground. It addresses direct and indirect discriminatory distinctions, and especially omissions. The failure of a state to have laws in place directed at discrimination against women is itself a problem, according to the committee, and that this issue of equal enjoyment is not restricted to the specific enumerated rights that on property or otherwise that we're talking about in the convention, but the convention opens up to say, you have a duty under this convention to make sure you do not target women and take measures against women in the political, economic, social, and other field, including with respect to all your other treaties and all your other obligations you may have. Uh, and many states have, as you all know, a lot of treaties in place. So this is an opening for the committee to go into, do you respect the right to health, either under the World Health Organization or under the Covenant on Economic, Cultural and Social Rights, or do you discriminate on the consequences of that as directed on women? The other extraordinary thing, which usually blows the mind of my private international lawyers, is that according to the committee, it is extraterritorial in effect. That is, the lack of any jurisdictional limitation means that states have a duty to make sure that what they do covers not just their own actions, but private actors, the market actors. If there's a company in your state that goes abroad, it too, when it goes abroad, has to respect these non-discrimination measures just as much in your territory as outside of it. And Another very challenging aspect is the convention says that you as a state have to go into the private sphere, whether it's religious, the family, or culture, and change the patterns of conduct that lead to unequal outcomes. And it targets, for example, rather controversially in the views of some, polygamy as a practice, and says that is inconsistent with the uh, CEDAW, and of course, polygamy has huge implications for property rights that we are focusing on. And for those of you familiar with the United States and affirmative action, uh, the CEDAW uh, Convention also anticipates and encourages states to take what it's called temporary special measures that may benefit women more than others precisely to accelerate uh, centuries of, of uh, inequality and structural uh, issues. So that's the frame. And the frame is also, for those of you who are familiar with Philip Olson and his tripart contribution to respect, protect, and fulfill, which he did in the course of the Maastricht Guidelines and then the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. So CEDAW says, you as a state have to yourself respect equality, protect women from inequality by others, such as market actors, and when that doesn't do enough, you, the state, have to step in and fulfill certain minimal requirements, for example, on housing. You, the state, have to provide housing, adequate housing, for those who are discriminated against. Um, and here are the specific provisions that uh, we included as property. At the outset, let me hope as, you, as we go through these, that you notice there's very little mention of the word property here. The two mentions of the word property in the entire convention. But we thought for various reasons we can get into that in fact, these are all about property, at least the way 
And remember, property is defined by each state. Uh, so there is no one single international definition of property. Uh, but in any case, it protects social security, maternal leave with pay, other areas of social life. That could be a convenient way to get into inheritance, for example, even outside the family context or family law. Social security programs, access to financial credit. Article 14 ostensibly is directed at women in rural areas and mentions, for example, critically, adequate living conditions in relation to housing. As the committee has interpreted this, it seems it's not restricted to rural women. It includes, uh, and, and we don't know how far it will go, but it apparently includes Roma women living in an urban uh, area in the North uh, uh, Macedonia cases. So that this question of having access to adequate housing is not just restricted to rural women. And that turns out to be quite significant, as we'll see in the case law. Equality before the law. Is, is something that many in the US would associate with due process. Uh, effective remedies is a European translation of that. And it includes equal access to be able to uh, contract uh, and administer land. So anything relation with that where you need the assets of a court or administrative agency uh, to give effect to your land. And perhaps most controversial, it would be judged by the number of reservations made to the CEDAW uh, convention when, and remember reservations have to be done at the beginning. You can't just decide, oh, I'd rather have one now, thank you very much. Uh, but there are a considerable number of reservations to Article 16 in particular. Not just to that, they often combine it with uh, many other rather sweeping ones. But this is particularly sensitive because it relates to uh, family relations, marriage, uh, personal status laws, but notice that that's one of the few places where property is specifically mentioned and, and it has given rise to some of the more, uh, let's just say, disputed uh, or at least not complied with uh, uh, recommendations issued by CEDAW. So what does this book actually do? And here we're getting into Judith Bowder's chapter two. It looks at the outputs of the CEDAW committee. What is that? General recommendations, some 17 of them out of, I believe, about 39 that, uh, in our view, relate to property. Hundreds of COs or concluding observations that the committee has issued from time to time in response to the state reports that all parties to the CEDAW, all 189, have to, have to produce supposedly every four years, but <clears throat> A lot of them are late, so there's a cumulative two reports perhaps being discussed at one time. And there are hundreds of them, so that was a particularly challenging part of this project. And then 15 views. Views are what the CEDAW committee issues when it responds to and accepts and issues a position on the merits of, uh, of individual or group communications. Remember, the views are restricted to those states that have ratified the optional protocol, so only 114 states are subject to that. And there is a special provision that turns on state consent for systematic uh, uh, and uh, violations of the convention, and two injury reports have emerged from that, again authorized by the optional protocol, uh, the ones dealing with Canada and South Africa. That's the outputs that uh, are analyzed and, and put into, as much as possible, uh, the CEDAW committee's own words. So that makes it a little lengthier, but it means that chapter two does not, I think, just replicate the commentary on CEDAW. We have now two commentaries on CEDAW. So I believe this is a, a more in-depth, and at least uh, according to our afterward writer, forensic examination of uh, the CEDAW committee's response. And this ends up producing, and I don't have time, obviously, to go through all of this. If you take the particular provisions that we just talked about and spill it out over the, uh, the uh, outputs, you get these eight areas where we think property jurisprudence is produced. Um, if you ask me, some of the most interesting occur in 
property rights in marriage, uh, with respect to land rights, but also, I think, especially in developed countries, social benefits. Uh, a particularly, by the way, controversial, uh, because at least some members of the CEDAR committee, there were some background interviews that we did, and at least one of those background interviews came back. I didn't know we did this. I didn't know we did. Uh, and in fact, this isn't property. Mm -hmm. These are social benefits. Mm -hmm. This is access to credit. This is intellectual property. And in that last chapter, I provide my explanation of why it's probably a good, a good thing if you started thinking about this more holistically, mm -hmm. and that if you want transformational change of one of the constructs of society, property happens to be one of them. So if you want to attack this, I am pleased, by the way, that along the way, as I presented this, uh, Cis uh, uh, Fetterman, who was chair of the CEDAW committee some time ago, said that what I was basically suggesting, but I didn't know that I was suggesting, was that uh, the CEDAW should adopt a GR on property, uh, which actually would be wonderful, even if they decided to disagree with anything in this book. But in any case, that's the, the scope of the inquiry. To get just slightly into uh, the details. So if you take a look at the now 15 views, uh, you can break them down in different ways, but I'm just gonna be selective here. So two complaints against Tanzania, what were they about? Uh, widows whose property had been seized by male relatives and uh, Tanzania decided in its courts that they can't do anything about cultural uh, or, uh, or particular views within the family. And the CEDAW committee said that property grabbing where the, these widows were left basically destitute, which by the way happens in many, many parts of the world. In fact, in a prior, prior iteration of this, I had a picture of an Indian widow uh, who was in, hot, in basically charitable uh, residence because of what happens to many Indian widows in that country, that is, they. They're basically, when they have the misfortune of having their husbands die, uh, the nearest male relative takes over their property and they're basically ostracized, not just from the family, but from society, uh, which is, of course, a violation of a number of CEDAR rights, not just property. North Macedonia, particularly interesting, as I mentioned before, these are Roma women, either with young children or pregnant. They come home to their shanty town to discover it has been demolished by the state, which has uh, authorized it to be developed. And these were illegal to be sure. They had no right to their shanty town. The committee there still found that even illegal squatters uh, cannot be subject to forced arbitrary eviction. That they not only had the right to a certain amount of process before their homes were destroyed and they were left homeless, but that the state, if it did such a thing, has to provide adequate shelter that is sensitive to their particular needs. For example, maternal access to maternal health. So that's one case, and I think we, we I talk quite a bit about forced evictions and the huge implications I think it has uh, if you narrowly conceive of landlord-tenant and the rights of of people only insofar as they have a particular yellow slip of paper called land title or something that it looks like a lease. These people had none of those and yet had rights. And this is the social benefits category. So many of these cases deal with something like happened in the Moldova case, namely someone who had devoted her life, 19 years of it, I believe, uh, to care for a disabled daughter that ultimately died and then found herself without any kind of government retirement benefit. No pension because she wasn't part of the paid sector. And so the committee has real problems with unpaid work, especially when it's structured to uh, basically to disqualify women because women are the ones who care for the disabled uh, relative or uh, the other uh, spouse, etc. So that was considered to be a violation and by the way, that is also applicable with respect to private employers, uh, as in other cases. And then there is a panoply of cases on right to housing in the wake of or during gender-based domestic 
violence, which alas is common all over the world, including the United States. So this is a picture from the San Antonio Express Times. If you look carefully, she has a black eye. She has spent very, uh, she had very little normal income, had to work extra to get the income to change herself. The locks on the door because no court was, was willing to give her a protective order in that state. This, alas, happens all over the world, not just outside in the US. Here are some of the countries where basically the state gives up or the police do nothing or the courts don't enforce the protection order. And in some cases, a woman, child or others end up dying at the hands of a domestic abuser and there's no protection for them. What is interesting from a property standpoint about these cases is that the CEDAW committee doesn't care if the husband is the one that has the lease or the husband is the one that owns the property. It overrides those rights and says, woman's access to tenure security, tenure actually tenure security is not based on a piece of paper. And therefore, it's also interesting how uh, the CEDAW committee reconceives of the value of a home. Home is about the values it protects, the capability that it enables, not about a commodity with a price tag, which is what you might see in, say, the investment regime. So those are some, in brief, some of that. Uh, there are two chapters uh, that cover the uh, criticisms of CEDAW from a theoretical standpoint, uh, and I'm not going to address those now, but these are what I think are my answers uh, to why I think those criticisms tend to be overstated. And that is uh, the CEDAW uh, committee has evolved the convention over time. So yes, the convention had certain ambiguities, certain flaws, uh, and certain gaps. But the CEDAW committee has evolved that sometimes in surprisingly teleological ways so that it included uh, domestic violence as a form of discrimination. It goes beyond rural women, uh, an article uh, as stated in Article 14, and does so in a way that I think was the trigger for intersectional discrimination as a whole. And I, we spend, or I spent a great deal of time saying that no, uh, unlike what many people have suggested, and here I'm talking about the uh, crits and toilers, uh, international human rights jurisprudence, and this specific one in particular, is not about advancing a neoliberal agenda that privileges, as the Washington Census did, private property, uh, private title to property, favors the commodification of everything, a privatization as opposed to state ownership, business deregulation and economic organization. And throughout, I think we point to specific parts of the CEDAW committee's jurisprudence that goes contrary to every one of those characteristics. And I think it's been unfair and rather a caricature uh, to describe the protection of property in international law as doing all of those things, leaving to decide whether that is true with respect to the investment regime. Right, and that's why I have a whole chapter uh, comparing the investment regime uh, to suggest the difference. And I think the critique that uh, it only protected or exported the values of liberal white women in the West is also vastly a caricature, given the intersectional discrimination. We can talk about the many different roles, identities, characteristics of women that are now part of the discourse in the CEDAW committee. And that it's also unfair, as Susan Marx and other Marxists have suggested, that the committee, because it doesn't challenge market capitalism, fails to address the root causes of that. I think the committee does, in a number of places, do that. And I will acknowledge that perhaps it doesn't do it enough, doesn't do it consistently, but that it's certainly uh, a caricature to say it ignores it. And that because of all of this, there is a continuing need for CEDAW to exist, to exist in Geneva, to provide supranational scrutiny over what states do 
and I don't care if you're the Netherlands and proud of your gender uh, position, or other notorious states that uh, I am ashamed to say are parts of the CEDAW, Afghanistan in particular, ratified the first Muslim state to do so without reservations and is there and is the target of what Ranjita and many others think should be a new crime uh, of gender apartheid. Uh, and in fact, uh, McKinnon and others might say genocide, uh, but in any case, uh, that gets into another conversation about the challenges of CEDAW. Now, uh, I've already exceeded my time, but let me very briefly indicate why this is not a celebration of CEDAW. The book does not get into the well-trod territory that CEDAW and other human rights regimes are not enforced. There are many responses to that, uh, but that's not this book. There should be another book trying to look carefully at which parts of CEDAW get implemented and which parts do not. My book is focused particularly on what flaws are there with respect to the jurisprudence that we're talking about. Because the premise of the book is, look, if you're looking, and we have so much scholarship on the Human Rights Committee's jurisprudence, on the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, mm -hmm. and so forth, why not? Why is it that there was such a gap in this scholarship? That is, I fear that uh, the jurisprudence of CEDAW, not only perhaps with respect to property, has been ignored, and the excuse is it's not implemented. Well, that's true of a lot of other human rights regimes. And so what I specifically focus on is the constraints imposed, including by the UN, with respect to page limits, time limits, and so forth, on what the CEDAW committee can do, which I think results in some of the less adequate parts of the outputs, including a case, for example, that I have with me, and I'll be glad to distribute to those here, I only have one copy, but I think it's a good example of the good and bad parts of CEDAW, which is their last view, ex v. Cambodia. Uh, it does a lot of things, ex v. Cambodia, in terms of the outputs. This was a case in which uh, a human rights advocate, she became a human rights advocate when her farm was destroyed by a huge uh, conglomerate, a huge business that was authorized to take over the land that she had title to, but they were authorized by the state. And by the way, the company was owned, I believe, by the wife of the Ministry of Mines in Cambodia. And uh, therefore, the land titles that she and others had was destroyed by the very action of the folks who demolished the property. And the CEDAW committee affirmed that was a violation of the human rights as, a, as an activist, but also, of course, as property. But it did so in a way that does not satisfy at least this lawyer. That is, all it did was say, here's the complaint, and we note the complaint in the following ways, and did nothing to tell me to develop the law, to interpret the law, or anything else. Obviously, one of the reasons is Cambodia didn't show up, but that hasn't stopped other adjudicators uh, to try to fill in the gap when the state, say, uh, U.S. in the Nicaragua case of the ICJ doesn't show up. Other problems are uh, are not just to CEDAW, the general sovereign backlash against human rights, the many existing treaty reservations that uh, some have been withdrawn, by the way, because the CEDAW committee criticizes them, uh, but that criticism does has not removed many of these reservations, and the fact that international law does not have a consistent view of what property rights are, so that it does have somewhat different views, let's just say, on what the protection of international law should be with respect to the rights of a foreign investor versus the rights of a woman under CEDAW. And what I try to do in that chapter is compare, what if you had a hypothetical in which you had a female entrepreneur and had the option of going through an investment uh, uh, investor state dispute settlement versus the committee. And I think that illuminates uh, some of the potential as well as the challenges of the CEDAW committee's particular uh, enforcement. 
And then there are, and we can spend a lot more time on this, what I consider to be, and this is my own view, of the committee's own pathologies and uh, jurisprudential gaps uh, that I think uh, if you want or you, if you expect harmonious, consistent uh, advice from the CEDAW committee, and I think both states and certainly human rights advocates and certainly women deserve it, you're not necessarily going to get it from the existing uh, concluding observations, the views, the general recommendations. There are lots of gaps, lock, uh, some lack of transparency. We can get into that hopefully in our discussion. Uh, so with that, I, I, I leave you um, and, uh, and, and just say that these are our criticisms, but overall that nice picture that you had at the front of the book is our uh, defense of the potential for transformational change through this committee. Thanks for listening. Jose, I want to start by celebrating you and your most recent honor, the Mandy Hudson Medal. No one could be more deserving of this high honor than you. This month, as Catherine knows, I have a short piece with NYU's Asia Law Institute on this year's Commission on the Status of Women's overarching theme, the feminization of poverty. And in my piece, I argue that poverty is not only about women's poverty of resources, but a feminization of a poverty of rights. And at the heart of the impoverishment of rights is the way women are still considered the property of men. Your magisterial commentary is the first comprehensive examination of the CEDAW's property jurisprudence. And it is co-authored by, in my opinion, one of the most distinguished legal scholars of our time. You and your co-author have plumbed the depths of the CEDAW and how its treaty body has addressed property rights. And the panoramic sweep of your inquiry is truly breathtaking, Jose. Especially at a time when human rights is facing a profound crisis, a backlash and a retreat from gender justice. Your study provides an essential reading of the important role of the CEDAW, but also the unfinished business of the CEDAW committee, especially its jurisprudence in terms of property and its relationship to life and liberty. So we are at a moment when we see an erosion of the commitments to gender justice in the United States and beyond, a steady rollback of hard-won rights, and you shine a spotlight on the fragility of rights and the imperfections in the realization of the social contract that is between the CEDAW and its state parties in the accountability process of the human, human rights treaty bodies. Your sweeping history also reminds us that we have the power to do more to realize the full promise of the convention. Your treatise is so critical because property rights are a litmus test, a barometer with regard to the status of women. Property has powerful impact on women's lives beyond the mere ownership of property. Property laws shape a woman's right to travel outside the home, get a job, pursue a trade or profession without permission of the men in her family, sign a contract, register a business, be deemed the head of household or head of family, open a bank account, choose where to live, have ownership over the inheritance of her uh, family, and also assail the husband obedience laws. In fact, a room of her own is often a protection against domestic violence. Property, as you know, is never just about property. It is a site of struggle over decision-making and control. The cultural construction of gender determines the ownership of property. And the construction and definition of culture is deeply embedded in property ownership, land ownership, inheritance, marital property, family benefits, dowry, and the system of mahal. Rules about family and property conceptually underlie other rules about employment and commerce banking and credit, education and welfare, and perhaps the very governance of the state. So the discourse around property is supported by what I call an invisible network of power, exercised mainly by male hierarchies and the state. 
You provide insights into new juxtapositions, including in foreign investment law and human rights, provide insights on the general recommendations and our concluding observations, and provide a high level of insights into the optional pro protocol. But your critique also shows us the complexities that continue to vex us. And what you have done is by naming, naming some of the problems that the seed of faces you have named and brought, made more visible what was hitherto invisible. Because the power of naming and the act of naming is important to make the invisible visible. So Article 2E on anti-discrimination holds accountable any person, organization, or enterprise, which is what you illustrated as the very heart of the convention. The CEDA is revolutionary in that it is the first treaty that dismantled the artificial dichotomy between the private and the public and brought the regulation of the family under international law. What happens in the intimate sphere is not outside the scope of human rights. What I would like to do is to highlight some of these contestations and ask you the way forward and maybe address some of the critiques that you have made. The CEDO is, as you know, the most heavily reserved treaty in the human rights system. Many of the reservations address key elements of the CEDO convention, the primacy of existing family law codes, particularly in Article 16. And the book addresses, but I feel that it can go further in addressing this tension between religion and culture and the rights system. Um, India, for example, cites their policy of non-interference in the personal affairs of any community and acknowledges the variety of customs, religions, and levels of literacy. As you know, India is the largest democracy in the world. And therefore, when it makes a reservation on Article 16, it goes to the very heart of the con convention. So given that the examination of property falls within the ambit of Article 16, how would you guide the committee to examine property rights, which are often sacrificed at the altar of religion or customs or culture? My question is, how do you examine discriminatory property arrangements in the name of culture and religion? The tension between religion and rights is the most enduring and pervasive challenge in women's human rights. Sometimes, as you know, the law itself, in the guise of culture, is complicit in women's discrimination. 148 countries encode customs, 87 countries encode customary laws. So in your own holistic examination of the convention, as you have, uh, as you have envisioned, Article 16 is often read together with Article 2, which is the anti-discrimination provision of the convention, Article 4, which is the substantive equality provision of the convention, which, which distinguishes our jurisprudence from a formal equality uh, uh, theory of change to adopting a substantive equality theory of change uh, and article 5 which is also revolutionary in that it asks us to address customs prejudices and stereotypes that um, uh, that impede the advancement of women's rights now in your gentle polemics you criticize the committee for lacking a theory of change when it comes to property and, um, and I think you rightfully address the fact that we adopt a substantive uh, gender equality theory of change rather than a redistributive justice theory of change. So, and that is true when it comes to addressing land tenure or what in China is referenced as responsibility land. So that we adopt a, almost a case by case approach rather than look at the ways in which the structural forms of gender discrimination, the institutionalized forms of gender discrimination in responsibility land or land tenure can be, uh, can be addressed. So my question to you is, how would you call us to go beyond a substantive equality theory of change to adopting a structural, uh, structural more institutional form of theory of change, which is transformative? Now, in your critique of Cambodia versus X2, you address the fact that uh, the committee did not go beyond a certain limited jurisprudence. 
And as you know, uh, the, that particular state party has been held, uh, has been allegedly um, um, condemned to, uh, to using the private sector and corporations in a land grabbing uh, initiative. And many NGOs, FIDH, Global Witness, and Climate Council have urged a preliminary examination by the ICC into land grabbing in this particular state party. And the international lawyer, Philip Sands, and Florence Mumba, who is a judge at the Extraordinary Chambers in the Court of Cambodia, have announced that they are drafting a definition of ecocide to be included in the list of international crimes that include such atrocities as genocide and crimes against humanity. Mm -hmm. So ecocide is now being considered a crime against humanity and is recommended to be included in the new draft Crimes Against Humanity Convention. And this is something that has been done in against the backdrop of the land grabbing in this particular state party. And um, uh, they have made recommendations to Fatou Ben Souda, the former ICC prosecutor, that ecocide be included in the Crimes Against Humanity by the International Criminal Court. So I understand your criticism that against the backdrop of these evolving uh, urgent and immediate concerns and crimes and what would be called crimes against humanity, can the committee take a larger role on these ma major new developments that are taking place both in the state party and across the world? And I think it also helps you know, the Bretton Woods institutions like the World Bank to take note because as recently as June of 2022, the World Bank announced another 93 million that would go fund the third phase of its land tenure project with the state party. So it is important that a more transformative, more structural vision should inhabit the work of the CEDAW committee. So um, I would also like to understand the ways in which your concerns about, and I think it is an interesting concern, um, you know, what Beth Simmons argues that property law is centrally concerned with relationships. And that is extremely true of Article 16. So how can we rearrange relationships, both in the family and the state, using property as an indicator? And in that vein, how can we address the gaps in customary laws? For example, who gets to speak in the name of culture? The role of traditional and religious leaders have been predominantly male. And um, one of the more important cases that came out of the South African Constitutional Court is the case of Shilubana, which addressed a daughter's succession to chieftainship. And in that case, the dispute was over the principle of female succession, the right to succeed as chief to the Valoe community in Limpopo in South Africa. And in that case, the chief's daughter, Shilubana, could not succeed to the chief position after her father's death because of her gender. Now, the South African Constitutional Court did a very um, nuanced balancing of rights. And the court decided that the very same communities that observe customary law must also be responsible for developing customary law and the evolution of the customary law. And the court acknowledged that the past practices should not be interpreted as being irrelevant in today's society since such practices and traditions may still be of considerable importance in customary law. And although the court did agree with the new evolution of the customary law that Shilubana should be um, should be allowed to take over the chieftainship. I think the court um, um, court did not go further to look at how many women have achieved that chieftainship position. Once again, it was a case by case situation that was particular and contextualized to that particular community, that particular group. So yes, can we go further to look at a more transformative ethos in looking at how women's leadership in a tribe or community can also address the ways in which property arrangements and family arrangements and the family relationships 
are reimagined and redefined. So my question to you is property is not only about property. Property is also about women's decision making. And women's, especially decision making in rural areas in the agricultural uh, communities. As you said, Article 13 of the CEDA also considers different forms of property, including family benefits, the right to bank loans, mortgages, and other forms of financial credit. So, my question to you is we are at this inflection point in the world's history when we are not only really facing a human rights crisis, but economic crisis. And at this time of structural adjustment and debt restructuring in many countries, how can we reimagine Article 13 to address some of those um, uh, structural changes that are ongoing? You spoke about Article 14 and its intersectional uh, evolution, that it goes beyond rural women to address uh, widows and older women and refugee women and indigenous women and women with disabilities and a growing category of uh, discriminatory uh, discrimination and growing category of um, intersectionality every generation encounters a new category of intersectionality which is very different from a more historic understanding of his uh, intersectionality so do we have the nimbleness to be able to address this in a way that really addresses the problems. And I would uh, call for the CEDAW to look at the Maputo Protocol. The Maputo Protocol, which is the African Charter on Women's Human Rights, really looks at it through those eyes of a changing context of the role of women and role of widows, the role of the elderly, the role of food security in property ownership, and also the role of what, um, what uh, the principles of the United Nations calls good neighborliness principles. The good neighborliness principles is very important, especially in a time of conflict, a farmer herd of conflict that we see in the frontier provinces of the Sahel region, in the frontier provinces of the African continent, where we see that a lot of the conflict that, uh, that is continuing and that is enduring is over water, is about the pastoralists and the agriculturists coming, uh, coming into conflict with each other, and how can these good neighborly principles be applied in a feminist manner to address the ways in which this has uh, deleterious consequences, mainly on the women. And then finally, my question to you, as you said, uh, the CEDAW is itself an evolutionary instrument. General Recommendation 25 really enshrines that principle that it must anticipate the emergence of new forms of discrimination and biases. So how would you, within that context of this being an evolutionary instrument, be able to address technology? What about mm -hmm. gender digital real estate? Mm -hmm. Would you consider that property in the metaverse? Um, then a artificial inter intelligence drives the ways in which we make decisions about mortgage and insurance claims and bank loans. How would real life biases bleed into algorithmic and data biases? And when it comes to banking and financial services, the problem of artificial intelligence will amplify those existing human biases in a way that women's property rights are once again limited and once again challenged. So those are a few of my questions, and I look forward to your response. So, so such easy questions and such limited time. Um, so one thing I, is the PowerPoint still? Oh, oh. I, I can yeah, because there, I just want to put one slide which demonstrates the uh, intersectionality point. Because I, what I did in, uh, I think, one part of the book is list all the identities, roles, that the committee has listed as relevant to inter, uh, intersectionality. So here's the list. It's quite a list. So um, one of the problems that I think I highlight, but I certainly don't answer, and I think we've addressed, is that we don't quite know what to make of this list. Is it cumulative? So if a woman is older, Roma, uh, lesbian, uh, and also has uh, single status and has a child, is that just one more 
thing and you add it up and of course she has to be discriminated or is it a what I would consider to be a little bit more understandable to people an examination of what uh, Sophia Moreau would say is pluralistic mm -hmm. discrimination concepts mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. Should we focus on things that are of tangible relevance to her social status, of tangible relevance to her capabilities to do some of the things as you described it, uh, or is there another test? In other words, part of the problem, I think, where I find the jurisprudential gaps is we don't have a theory of wrongful discrimination to make sense of this, right? And it would be stronger if we did have some way of putting these things together rather than having a list that is cumulative, which goes to some of your other points, which I guess I'm heartened that a member of the CEDAW committee is more radical than the book is <laughs> about the critiques, because I guess what you're saying is you stopped too short. You could have said, here's all the other things they should be doing. And I, and, and I agree with you, but I think part of it is the constraint of how the committee is perceived. So that when I see the literature, uh, including in chapter two, by the way, that when you have state reports and you have concluding observations, this is a quote, constructive dialogue. <clears throat> My heckles go up because when, uh, yes, you can be constructive the first time China comes forward. You can be constructive the second time China comes forward. But eight years later, the same problem appears. I think you can be a little less constructive. And therefore, that's where I would hope a more radical committee could say, not just with respect to China, I talk about the concluding observations of Pakistan, uh, God knows if Afghanistan were to come forward, uh, that would be a little fiery, but I regret that it may not be fiery enough. In other words, I think part of the problem I think you're highlighting is the silos in which we discuss this as a matter of UN bureaucracy. The special rapporteur is over there. The SDG effort is over there. The folks on UNCTAD discussing how international investment agreements might be made more sensitive to G, uh, SDG 5 are over there. And none of them cross the path. So I think as much as I would like to support the idea that the committee should be at the forefront of defining new crimes or encouraging ecocide or now domicide by the Special Rapporteur on Housing or Gender Apartheid, under its current constraints, I think, I doubt whether you would get consensus in the committee, which is what I understand to be the position for GRs, certainly. And if it turns out to be an opinion in a view, I suspect that's where you're going to get a dissent, which I'm not sure in this context is as, as, as as let's say desirable as in others. Uh, but I, I don't take an issue with anything that you say in the way of substance and the interconnection within this. I do, in, in terms of the criticisms of the CEDAW committee, what I detect is very big timidity when it comes to religion. So when I look at the report, let's just pick a European country uh, on France, and the concluding observations. France has, as you know, uh, what is considered a rather controversial position mm -hmm. on secular society in France that prohibits religious garments of all kinds uh, throughout education from high school to university. From a US perspective that violates free association, but for uh, those who think of the harsh realities of the hijab over time, it's a difficult position for France. So at one point in these slides, by the way, I said that what the CEDAW committee does is it universalizes a, a room for a, a, a room of one's own. And I had a picture of what um, Virginia Woolf must have had in mind, a nice Victorian room, uh, uh, only because uh, the UK had been the beneficiary of colonial riches that it grabbed and so affording a certain lifestyle to a privileged writer. And what I said, is, at least on the side of, of CEDA, is that it universalizes this. And I had a picture of a woman in her job with a key to a room saying that it stretches the concept to cover more women along this line. But of course, your criticism is more devastating than that. What 
good is it a room of one's own if it's a prison uh, on domestic violence? And so I do think that that's where uh, some of the criticisms of the committee for not being transformative enough are true. That is, the committee does look at root causes, but it stops here. It doesn't go further and it doesn't go all the way, certainly on religion. So on the French report, all we see is a question by the committee, France, can you report back as to whether your policy on secularism and religious garb have had a discriminatory impact on women with respect to education? Just a question. That's as far as it goes. It doesn't take a position on this rather tricky issue. Why I think it's tricky is that I think the Nanapu protocol is of two minds on this point. So uh, what I cite in the book are many uh, third world approaches to international law, sympathetic scholars who say the committee just fails to recognize that women are also part of those religious practices, that they are, their identities is tied to being a Muslim or being tied to a particular religious tradition and that the committee can't just simply say end polybigamy that they have to work within uh, the, that society and be, I interpret what they're saying, more tentative, so that the committee should be very cautious on this. That's a very different position than to full frontal attack on religious tradition. And I don't know enough about the atmosphere in Geneva to know whether that could or could not be effective. And I suspect it depends on the country context. One thing that people tell me, and I'm very curious about what you think. In chapter two, we say things about the follow-up procedures and that in Geneva, it is anticipated that the contact between civil society and the committee members is not restricted to those few hours where they're together in that formal room, but that it's expected that civil society would be talking to the committee members and lunch and other places to assert their views. I have been told that some countries no longer want that to happen. And I'm curious without mentioning countries, whether you feel free at one of these Geneva sessions to have free and open contact with any member of civil society, no matter where they're from, and whether that could hurt you or could hurt so that's a question back to you because mm -hmm. your questions were so easy to answer. So mm -hmm. thank you, Jose. So I wanted to stress that I think the committee's diversity is our strength and the plurality of ideas and positions is, is one that enriches the committee. So yes, we do uh, work on consensus, but we build that consensus by listening to these different divergent and diverse views that are very plural in nature. So my critique is one that I made as a scholar and an academic, but in my own role in the CEDAW and on the committee, what I see is that a cautious approach is one that is more constructive. That if we go on you know, what you call a full frontal attack of states' parties, it will not always work that that is not the approach that can really help to make change. So when I say cautious, we are really being strategic. So for example, when we are addressing some of the personal status laws that I spoke about, which to a large degree embodies some of the religious and the cultural practices that, uh, that see women as second-class citizens, the state parties have over time, because of the CEDAW's, uh, the CEDAW's constructive dialogues, begun addressing those, uh, 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 those discriminatory provisions in the personal law. So and I'm happy to mention this. Djibouti, when it came before us, told us in no uncertain terms that it was in the, it was in the, in, in, in the process 
process of amending its personal status laws and taking a leaf from not only the international women's human rights agenda, but from Tunisia's more progressive laws. Now, those are the recommendations that the CEDAW committee uh, makes that, you know, similarly situated countries have begun the process of change and are part of this reformist project. And therefore, there is no reason why a country that is similarly state but is similarly situated cannot follow suit. So what we see is that that progress, the march of progress is slow, but it is happening. The same with uh, Oman. Oman also mentioned that it is uh, changing its personal status laws in line with some of the other countries in the Gulf. It is slower than what we would want to, but in our recommendations, we do talk about the ways in which without delay. Yes, so it is progressive. It is unlike the ICCPR, which has to be a set of negative rights, which mm -hmm. you know calls for immediate changes. This is just to a large extent a progressive uh, change that you know you've talked about too. But yes, I do find that the the major major tension here is one that is almost um, uh, uh, that that places the CEDAW in a position of interfering or. Uh, or, or, or in the role of being an intermediary when it comes to religion and uh, other cultural practices. And there's a lot of diversity even within the CEDAW committee. But I think what, what even I am grappling with is, you know, I am a secularist, but I do understand that change can also happen not only through rights, but through religion. And there are many forces that are working on reclaiming religion. Uh, feminists around the world are reclaiming uh, religion and creating a feminist interpretation of the religion. However, with due respect to that, the human rights, the human rights framework is a secularist framework. And it is the primacy of the human rights framework that needs to be privileged. But at the same time, what we can call for is an enabling environment for civil society, human rights defenders and feminist leaders, both in religion and outside of religion that can help make change within the religion and outside of the religion. So that is the way in which we try to balance the primacy of the secularist human rights framework, but also providing a, a civic space that will allow feminist leaders who are reclaiming their religion and culture in the image of both men and women. Excellent. And, 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 and I want to open up, obviously, if we have questions. Catherine, um, because I know we only have, what, 15 minutes? 15 more minutes. Yeah, yeah. so I, I will resist uh, uh, this. But one, if you are curious, for example, on this question of secularism versus religion, don't just focus on states that are associated with being religious states. Look at Singapore's report from 2017, where Singapore purports to reserve mm -hmm. with course. respect to Absolutely. its Muslim oh. acts Absolutely. and how Muslims are treated. Absolutely. And what's interesting to me in that report is that the, the committee doesn't say, oh, you reserved. The committee goes right into it mm -hmm. and says, uh, that that's, uh, violates the object and purpose. Absolutely. You need to do the following things even with your set commitment to secularism, which is a big deal in Singapore. This is, this is very at the heart of how uh, they define the society. But I think that is an interesting case of the CEDAW committee pushing. What I also interpret your remarks as being consistent with, that some things uh, are in Geneva, but don't stop in Geneva. That is the goal is to have the South African court mm -hmm. do something. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and there's the shadow of Geneva, Absolutely. which is often perceived as a threat by some countries, Absolutely. but is part of why I think the story of no compliance is, is a bit of a fraud. That is, we do spend some time saying, this is not a book about compliance, but just thinking about compliance and that automatic on-off switch way is wrong. Uh, that is, 
this is part of an ongoing struggle uh, that involves many actors. CETA is only one of them. So I hate to interrupt this uh, interesting conversation, but we do have a few questions, and I think people in the room probably have as well. I'm looking at some from the, uh, from the live stream. I want to just quickly ask one from Rebecca Cook. Oh, um, Rebecca's on. Oh, Hi, Rebecca. <laughs> Somebody I should have thanked long yeah. ago. Yeah. So um, unfortunately, uh, I apologize, Rebecca. The first question you typed in, I think a word or two is dropped, so I can't quite re read it. But I'll, I'll go to the second one. Um, she says, uh, to your point on the UN silos, uh, what is the FAO doing on women's property rights? Are there any CEDAW efforts to engage with the FAO on women's property rights, um, perhaps with AGR? So this has been a mystery to me, Rebecca. So I have tried in my own modest way to see if the FAO is interested in hearing about the book. Uh, just to, to test the waters. And I am told that, yes, they are interested in this issue, but apparently not in the book. But that's fine. I don't take that personally. But I think that there is some work there. My own suspicion is that it's still at a somewhat early stage. All right. So I'll go to another one from online. At, oh, and, and Rebecca, if you want to re-enter your first question, try again. Um, We'll, we'll come back to that to you. So, um, may I uh, respond to Rebecca on oh, the on, Oh, please. Uh, yes, sure. So, Rebecca, I think this is one of the more important questions and the ways in which the scepter of food insecurity and the feminization of food insecurity has become now a reality given the economic crisis, given the post COVID uh, uh, crises of climate and conflict. And so I have asked questions on not only food insecurity, but the ways in which women and girls are often the last to eat mm -hmm. in families that are food insecure. So that therein lies the gender discriminatory aspect of food insecurity, because food insecurity itself is a major national security issue. But the ways in which traditionally and historically women and girls have been almost always the last to eat then makes food insecurity have a face that is a woman. This also comes, of course, uh, through the position of women on uh, facing climate change, mm -hmm. right? So at least the CEDAW committee is starting to, to talk about that. And I think it's becoming quite well known now that the consequences fall in disproportionately on, on women and girls. OK. So um, I wonder how CEDAW principles can handle the conflicts between community level democracy, mm -hmm. which institutionalizes and legalizes gender asymmetry in local customs, and women's land rights in rural areas. And the questioner doesn't mention this, but I would just add, you know, I mean, this is this is the epitome of what we see in the Chinese countryside, because the rural land is held by village Absolutely. collectives and the men Absolutely. vote in the village collectives about what happens with uh, disposition allocation of land and gets reallocated. And if a woman Absolutely. is divorced or is simply single and yeah. wants to live on her own, she doesn't get the allocation. So yeah, so democracy versus um, land rights. So in principle, the CEDAW committee says uh, we don't care about the communal uh, responses. Uh, the individual woman uh, farmer uh, should have uh, the equivalent of title, even if it's not physical title, therefore being able to get agricultural credit, for example, to be able to continue and expand uh, the family farm. Uh, where it gets a bit dicey, I think, with the, with the CEDAW committee is when the community is an indigenous community and therefore falls into one of yes. its other categories Perfect. up here, yeah. right? And this, for those of you who study these issues uh, from a Canadian perspective, mm -hmm. is the Lovelace. Mm -hmm. A type of yes. case where the individual right a woman might have might clash with the indigenous cultural traditions that many people want to maintain. That is a bit more difficult, I think, for the committee. Mm -hmm. uh, where I see interesting developments is at the remedial stage, where uh, you often see, and not just with the CEDAW committee, but now with the Economic, Social, and Cultural mm -hmm. Rights uh, Committee where they separate out the remedies. Here's what the individual gets in terms of compensation. 
But here's what you, the state, have to focus on with respect to preventing this in the future. The laws that you have to change, if it's a cultural issue or relegated to the cultural level, what is it? what would it take for the state to intrude in that so that it doesn't just become a remedy for the individual complainant uh, in, say, a view, but beyond that? Uh, of course, one of the problems with, uh, with many of the states, of course, of the of the part of the CEDAW is that they're not parties to the optional protocol. So the only opportunities are really the COs, uh, the concluding observations on state reports, which, which cannot, because of the nature of them, and you can tell us more about the process, cannot be as nuanced uh, with respect to remedies or uh, cannot necessarily get into the nitty gritty of the situation. So in the last chapter that you have, I go through the Chinese report and criticize the concluding observations for not getting into the very things that Catherine, you have pointed to, which is well, well known in the literature about why, despite the, uh, the equality women have under Chinese law, the reality is very different, not just with respect to access to agricultural land and making decisions on that land, but divorce. Uh, that is access to divorce, access to mar marital property in the real world, as opposed to uh, the, the law in China, which the law, as I understand it, is quite uh, clear. And yes, men and women have equal rights to divorce, and men and women have equal rights to marital property, uh, and everything's fine. But when you actually look at important books written on this, some of which have been presented in, in our series, uh, the reality is quite different. The judges are under injunction to uh, let's stay together as a family and produce more children. Thank you very much. And therefore, yes, he's a domestic abuser, but we won't talk about that. Just stay together. And therefore, that ends up being that a woman under threat, a very real threat, objective threat, is, is forced to concede to the husband because only through the husband's consent to divorce will she actually be safe. And therefore, the consent to divorce is often tied to give me the property, please. And so that's the reality. And, uh, and the, the dire situation that is portrayed in the literature, where these women face literally life and death decisions because of this, is in a rather anodyne fashion uh, discussed in the report, which leaves somebody familiar with what's really happening and I suspect a lot of people, not just those who read the books, but actually suffer the consequences, are very dissatisfied with it. So, uh, excellent question. So first and foremost, the premise is that culture is not immutable, that these dynamic shape-shifting protein, and that it, ch it changes with each encounter, and that this cannot be uh, set in stone or in some kind of uh, amber situation. So in terms of China, because you use that as an example, Catherine, and you, Jose, I have written about responsibility land and how that tends to be not gender sensitive or take into account the fact that women may divorce and be widowed and go back to their uh, own villages and therefore lose uh, access to the responsibility land. And as well as when we, women move into a new village, uh, uh, you know, post marriage, there may no longer be responsibility land to be distributed. And therefore that causes issues because it's women who migrate to the, to the village of the husband and not the other way around. So are, these are very gendered issues and that the committees are predominantly male. And that is why in my own uh, comment to you, I spoke about the issue of the chieftains, because I am looking at who are the interlocutors of culture? Who are the interlocutors of these traditional practices? It's mainly men. And even when courts rule that women have that right, you see how uh, there is almost this kind of sense of um, cautious. It is um, a sense that the, the, the change must be endogenous rather than superimposed, that the change must happen from within the culture. Mm -hmm. So there is, as you say, a bit of temerity when it comes to making that change, even when this, uh, the constitutional court 
is uh, progressive. And um, uh, so, so therefore, I think this issue has to be seen against the backdrop of gender equality and women's participation in decision making. So the issue of property can only be addressed through those lenses of are women there in the family as heads of household? Are women considered um, decision makers in the state when it comes to either uh, you know, appropriation of land, the reallocation of land in terms of responsibility land and other land tenure in, in the African continent too? So just one, one example of the ways in which the CEDAW plays a role is that, you know, in recently in a state party report, I added a whole new section, which I call shrinking of the civic space, where I called for uh, the state party uh, uh, being amenable to the exercise of the rights of human rights defenders, human rights uh, uh, women journalists, and women political dissenters. Now, that's a new term, women political dissenters, because that, that those rights of women political mm -hmm. dissenters are crucial, critical to the exercise of property rights. So, for example, in some of these state parties, and I don't want to mention names, there are women agrarian workers, agricultural workers who are protesting uh, food insecurity, who are protesting in front of the president's office and the president's gates. So it is important that we see that the shrinking of the civic space also shrinks women's access to the economy and to the marketplace and to, to, to land life. So you spoke about the Lovelace case, and that is a really paradigmatic you know, example of the ways in which these rights sometimes collide, the collision of rights, the indigenous rights, the rights of underrepresented group, with women's rights, Shabano case in India, the rights under Muslim law, mm -hmm. and then women. And there are many cases where you know there is this kind of uh, representation of the collision of rights. And how do we balance it? The balance is very clear. ICCPR calls for the religious rights, but it says in very clear terms in the General Comment 28 that no right can violate. No other right can violate the rights of women. So the primacy of women's rights are enshrined in both the ICCPR and the CEDAW. So when you talk about balancing, it is the, it is the fact that women's rights cannot be sacrificed in the exercise or the vindication of any right to religion or culture. So we are almost at time. We have basically one minute. Um, so I'm you have one question here. <laughs> Okay. All right. You'll get the last question then. Go ahead. And the response will have to also be yes, one minute. Just okay. <laughs> or we'll just, or this could be your just or this speech. Could, this could be your final, <laughs> you, you can take us out. Um, I was just curious about your talk on the methods, because my understanding is that if states actually submitted their uh, country report on the schedule that they were intended to meet, uh, CEDAW would not be able to like keep up with it. Um, and I'm curious if you see that uh, as a problem of resources or maybe just a fundamental uh, need to reconsider the um, schedule on which states are supposed to instead of uh, maybe like relying on the fact that states are going to make into the world. It is a resource issue. Yeah, and remember that uh, it's a page issue, also a translation issue. As I understand it, the UN is under general cutbacks. Huge, huge. So, and you know, at one point in the book, I tentatively suggest that you know maybe the golden age of C. Dodgers has is past because the constraints are such, um, and I think they're partly political. Um, certainly, the U.S. in the past in other areas has used its financial veto, in effect. Uh, to uh, to try to move the UN in certain directions. So this is not uh, something new. And also not being exercised or cuts are not being made in a discriminatory way. Absolutely. <laughs> so uh, may, may I add one last thing? You know, given the fact that we have one of 
the world's preeminent scholars writing this book on uh, on the CEDAW and property rights. And he also happens to be the United uh, happens to be an American. I want to make a carrion call to uh, <laughs> call a call, well, what I would call a call to justice for the United States to ratify the CEDAW. Um, I will do then, it. Will then do it. Senator Biden said time is a wasting, and he made the ratification of the CEDAW part of his first campaign promise and pledge, which he hasn't still fulfilled. We hope that this being an election year, he will once again make this a part of his campaign and fulfill the promise that he will make to the American people and to the people and to the women of the world. From your mouth to Biden's ear. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.